My name is Louis Pelou. I'm 44 years old. I'm a documentary photographer and I was born in Canada. Uh, this is my first time in Georgia and I find Tbilisi a very fascinating place. Not just for what I see now, because I always wonder what the history of the place is and how many stor different stories I can learn about a place from its history. I think the Kolga Photo Festival is a fantastic way of people from different countries and different places, different beliefs, uh, meeting in another place, which is not very, not often has a lot of photographers in it, meeting and talking about ideas. I gave a workshop here uh, over three days with uh, uh, several Georgian photographers and students and uh, the, the focus of the workshop is long-term projects and uh, I've been doing long-term projects for about 23 years, uh, some ranging in 12 years long, some five years, some two years. And I think the, the root of everything is learning the basic fundamentals, you know, uh, composition, long form editing. And when you don't know your fundamentals and you do a project that's going to end up being 50 to 80 photos as the final edit, all your weaknesses show up right away. So uh, you need to have a broader view of what makes a good photograph. This is not a news assignment where you're going to shoot one good news photo and then you leave. You're looking for 50 or 60 photos that work together as a narrative. And uh, this is what we focused on over the last three days. All the fundamental skills, the building blocks to achieve that long form narrative of 50, 60, to even 80 photos. Uh, the fighting season is uh, a project I did in Kandahar, Afghanistan over five years between uh, the years 2006 to 2010. I worked uh, embedded covering the military and I worked alone covering civilians. Uh, I think it's important to try and balance your stories. Uh, the, the fighting season followed uh, another project I did before that which was 12 years which is kind of where I learned all my basics. Uh, that was Cage Call, it's a project in the mines. Uh, the fighting season is a body of work that really, as much as it takes place in Afghanistan, really is not about Afghanistan. It, it's kind of like how Apocalypse Now, the film, Francis Ford Coppola's film, is based on The Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad. Uh, it's, it's about war, you know, it's about what conflict does, it's about violence, it's about all the deeper layers of what people turn into when they, they kill each other. How do I prepare for such a trip? You know, every trip I go on, uh, I try and prepare myself as best as possible. And uh, I'm able to uh, prepare only so much because you cannot prepare for landmines and bombs going off and people being killed. And how over the years you psychologically and emotionally uh, react, you know, because I'm a human being and I'm seeing human beings in extreme situations. Um, I think living a healthy lifestyle is very important. I think always reminding yourselves of the best human qualities and values that you can have in being in these situations and really remembering that it's a privilege that you're being uh, in a place to witness these horrific things and to use that privilege as a witness, as a photographer, to document what's going on and to make sure that you're bringing back those photographs which really are uh, using a peaceful tool, a camera, a peaceful tool to bring back such a violent story to have a peaceful dialogue and discussion about the problems of the world, which is, you know, a common recurrent thing is war and violence in this world. Uh, let me set that up. You know, before I got to the Marines, that was in my third year of going to Afghanistan. And I had heard the Marines were coming back. They had been in Iraq, uh, mostly, and uh, this was 2008. And for about three minutes, three minutes, three months, I'd covered uh, a lot of frontline fighting and uh, in Kandahar. And after daily combat, I was very, very tired of uh, photographing the same thing. People shooting, dead people, dead bodies, more sort of reportage photos, sort of reactionary pictures. Pictures that you look into, you know, there's two kinds of pictures I find sort of fundamentally. Photos you look into and photos that look out at you. And I wanted a set of portraits of the, the soldiers to show how young they were, uh, who they were, where they were from, and photos that you had to confront. You had to confront the people who are being killed and doing the killing as well. So every day we'd go out 
they'd go on patrol and combat, we would come back, and then I would take their photographs, and it was in a, a bunker, like an underground bunker with some sandbags, had very nice lighting, it was all natural light, and I spent about a month getting to know them, and maybe five minutes per portrait taking their picture. Most of the time was spent getting to know them. I think the only problem with staying somewhere or working from somewhere is if the photographer or the journalist doing the work is not experienced and knowledgeable enough to understand the setting that they're in. Uh, let's face it, in the history of war photography, photographers have followed soldiers around and lived with soldiers from, from the beginning of some of the earliest combat photography, which is, say, the Spanish Civil War. And if you, if you think about the Spanish Civil War, uh, Robert Capa, Gerda Taro and Seymour Kitchim, who all went there together, they went there to be against the other side with their photographs. I mean, they were already taking a side. I mean, the whole premise of photojournalism or journalists is supposed to be neutral. And that's not a criticism, but that's a well-known fact. Uh, I always reminded myself that I am not with them, that they, they kill as much as the Taliban does kill. If you want access to the violence, and if you want access to show the true cost of war, the casualties, the dead, then you have to go in, in, in those, type, those parts or that kind of fighting, in that particular conflict. The only way to get to the most violent areas is to be with those soldiers. And uh, I was never influenced by it. I think if you look at my work, I got plenty of horrific photographs, casualties on both sides, uh, photographs of, of, of people and of the result of the killing. So I think it's only a problem if you let it be a problem that you don't know how to solve or work around. I think a lot of people who had problems with embedding problems did, either did not have the experience or did not understand how to work around the obstacles and the challenges. Uh, let me put a parallel sort of discussion to this. There is not a single uh, news event that you will not go cover that someone will try and influence how you're covering it, whether you're covering a police riot in your city. Go to a press conference with any politician. Uh, political rallies, uh, political speeches, are far more controlled than, than embedding is, actually. Uh, most of the, the documents you sign for embedding have to do with your safety and the soldier's safety so that you are not influencing the, the, the killing or the wounding of people. So I never had a problem. If, if there was a, I didn't feel like I was getting the access I want, I just changed to a different area. But all the most famous war photographs, almost all of them, say from the Second World War, are from, they didn't call it embedding, but they were with troops. Yeah, my interests are always last, actually. So when I was in Afghanistan, uh, although you're, this body of work you're seeing is work I did mostly by covering soldiers, I have uh, uh, many bodies of work from Afghanistan, and, and one is from photos I took on my own out in Kandahar City. Uh, the most important thing when you're working on your own is usually working with a fixer. A fixer is a, usually a local journalist that you hire as a guide, translator, driver, someone who fixes, who works things out for you. Uh, it's their safety first because they live there. They got to stay there and you can leave. So uh, my first priority is the safety of my local contact or my local fixer. And then uh, it's making sure that I'm covering the story ethically that I'm being truthful. And then my interest and my safety, of course, come in where I, I need to come back with a story and I have a family that loves me and I want to come back in one piece as well. The reason why I cover the conflict in Kandahar is it ties to my family history, suffering in conflict in the Second World War. And uh, I really felt like in my lifetime, I, I have a window to say something about the world, and if I can remind people about the suffering of others, then that's my job. Oh, long-term projects. You know, my first project was like 12 years. It was like, I would stop working. I'm like, I had it with this thing. You know, I just, I was inexperienced. I, I was young. I just, I went like a shooting machine. I just, I have so many negatives. The edit of my miners project, this is just the tip of the iceberg. The, the negative piles are in big bins at home. It's like, whoa, you know, it's like Raiders of the Lost Ark. You go and it's like, oh, I totally forgot about these pictures. Or I was an inexperienced editor, so there are all these photos that are great that I didn't put in the edit because I didn't know what I was doing. So um, 
I'm constantly making laser prints or small prints, and I'm constantly editing narratives to see what the concept can be. It's not always about your classic Life magazine style narrative. I, I, I believe we've moved far past this. You know, I grew up looking at photo narratives and series in books. So for me, I never looked at magazines or newspapers. So I thought every project's supposed to be 50 pictures, 60 pictures, right? So uh, I always work toward having this many photographs. So I would shoot, and when I started seeing something that was having maybe a front and a back and a middle, then I would shoot some of the little pieces in between. I would work it out. And then I would start thinking, how will I share this with people? Will it be an exhibition? Will it be in a book? Will it be published online? What am I going to do with it? So I think slowly I built my practice and, my, and, and sort of my, how I looked at the concept of sharing the work in different ways. And so with the Mexico work, just like the Afghanistan work, I've edited it into uh, publications that can become exhibitions. That it's both a, a, a print and, and an exhibition that can come apart because it's the merging of my youth as an artist and also as uh, my, my, pa my past and my present as a photojournalist. So it's like the merging of the two. Many times, uh, I was in Afghanistan, there's many, many times, let's give you one example. Uh, I was walking with some soldiers and one soldier stepped on a landmine and it blew his foot off. And uh, the medic asked me to hold the IV bag so I, I held the IV bag, I, you know, I wasn't going to take photos, it's, I'm going to help. In, in a humanitarian situation, I'll always help. I will never carry a weapon, I will never fire a weapon, and I do not want a weapon. So I will never, I'm not a combatant, I'm a neutral witness. So uh, there have been many wounded people that I've had, you know, people have asked, and this always comes first. Well, and this is the other thing is, I think a lot of people make mistakes when they look at my photographs. The most people, I fo most soldiers I photographed in Afghanistan were Afghan soldiers. Actually, all my most well-known images are of Afghan soldiers. And that's the whole point, right? To cover the people that are there. Yes, I have pictures of Western soldiers. This is part of the history and the events and what's going on. Uh, I think I learned that, you know, people from Afghanistan are not all the same. It's kind of like, say, in Germany, people from Bavaria and people from Berlin are like two completely different people. And you can't assume there's only one kind of place. So people in Kandahar are very different people in Kabul. I think what I learned is that these are people who have been suffering for many decades. These are people who, although from the outside it seems like they're, they're very violent and very poor and maybe not very educated, yes, there's been a lot of violence there. Yes, there's not very good education. Everything has been destroyed. And I think that they're just hoping to have what we have, a normal life. Well, I think I learned a lot about myself, and I, I think the greatest thing I learned is that uh, anger, violence, these are things I do not want in my life. I, I never really had them from myself, but um, I think I can always be positive. After being there, there's not much that can happen to me that I'm going to be negative about. Because I'm not getting bombed, I got my legs, I'm intact, I'm whole, you know, uh, I don't have to worry about where my food's coming from, you know. I live in a modern kind of house, I have a bath, you know, most of the people, I, I, civilians I saw in Afghanistan, the house is made of mud, there's no electricity, no running water, there's no toilet, I mean, it's like biblical times, it's like back to the times of the Bible, you know, so, I learned to appreciate what I have in a new way. No, I personally think that photography can't change anything. I think what I can do is I can create a new dialogue or, or revive a dialogue for the people who can change. And the people that change things are the masses or the people who are the voters. You know, voters vote in or have a civil war or have a revolution. These are the people that I, I can empower in a small way. You know, I don't, I don't believe photographs do the changing. The photo doesn't do the changing. People do the changing. And people need to be empowered by many, many things. And photographs are one of those small of many things that people can have to use to empower themselves to make change. Groups of communities of people change things. I know it can change because it has changed. Uh, 
I like to shoot in a very raw, straightforward way. Uh, I'm not into any gimmicks. I'm not into, you know, hips to mat. I, all these trendy looks, I don't feel I need to do that. It's, it's all about what's in the picture for me, you know? It's, it's, it's about looking for deeper visual layers to talk about something, not adding a color or a Photoshop effect. That's just my personal opinion. If other people want to do that, you know, I buy other approaches like that. But I really find that changing the technology is not creative. This is easy. Someone else is creating that technology, not you. You're not being creative when you're using these technologies in, in these trendy ways. Because really, I think what's important is being creative with, with how you use the camera and capturing th something in a photo. That's creative, an approach, a concept. But I think that using technical tools like this, I think is the easy way out. It, 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 it's the path of least resistance. So I like people who use a little more complexity in their work. Take, for example, uh, Zona by Carl de Kaiser. He's a Magnum photographer. I think that that project is about Russian prisons. This is a fantastic project. Shot very simple and straightforward. Color, very, I think it's with a 6x7 camera. Very simple, very complex ideas. Very complex emotions and histories. Telling about a greater sort of theme. And this is what I'm most interested in. Yeah, don't go do it. My first advice, I'll start, you know, if, if you want to do it, I say think twice about it. Uh, there are people who will want to do it no matter what. So if they're very serious and, and they're committed and they will want to go do it, then I think that um, you need to understand that the, the injury nobody talks about that you can have. I mean, there's the obvious injuries where people have been killed, people have lost their legs, been shot. I have friends that have suffered all of those. Uh, is psychological injuries. I have friends who, you know, are mentally ill now. And you don't know when you're being wounded by these injuries, and it's, it's not often talked about. It, you know, when someone who has a mental injury, you don't walk around missing your arm, you know. You, you don't know how you're being hurt when your mind is being hurt. So I think that uh, this is the biggest thing you must understand, that once you go there and see these things and experience these things, you can never return to who you were ever again. You will be forever changed. And if you want this person back, you can't have this person back. The old Felix, the old Louis, you can't have them back. They're gone. So once, once you learn that, then it's good to find someone who's done it and try and learn the logistics of it. You know, Where to be, where not to be. There's some good classes that train you for it. You should learn first aid. There's a lot of basics after that. But you have to understand that there's not a lot of retired combat photographers. And that I consider myself just a documentary photographer. I have covered conflict, but I'm not a war photographer. I don't believe in just covering war. It's like a one note symphony. You know? Definitely. You know, I've covered a lot of combat and uh, I've seen a lot of terrible things. I've seen more terrible things than a lot of soldiers have been to many wars. And I think that uh, you, you have to learn a management system. Uh, there probably isn't a day that goes by that, you know, somehow it, it becomes a part of who you are after a while, you know? It's not like I'm having screaming nightmares or anything like that, but it's definitely who you are. You know, after a while, it's like your childhood, you know? Par parts of, over time, certain things go away, but little small aspects remain. So it does, it does become part of who you are. Uh, I think I see photojournalism continually being a part of who we are as a society. I think that uh, there's a lot of, look, you know, there's a lot of people who are really negative saying, oh, the industry's dying, newspapers are closing. Could you imagine the monks who used to transcribe the Bible when Gutenberg made the printer? They're probably having a heart attack up in the monastery like, oh my God, we can't make any more Bibles. We're over as monks, you know. And then the Gutenberg Press came out and we start, started printing presses and books and we end, ended up in newspapers. Now we have the internet. And I think that adapting and changing to modern and progressive times is going to continue. But I think that photojournalism is going to evolve and continue to be a part of our daily lives. And I think that it's uh, important to keep training photojournalists and keep advancing the dialogue on how, how we operate and how we function and how we live amongst our society. Uh, 
you know, I, I do a lot of research and studying. I, I, no one really studies the history of art enough or, or, or visual, sort of, the history of visual arts. Multimedia is documentary film. Multimedia is new technology. Multimedia is not a new creative outlet. Documentary film is moving pictures, audios and stills put together. It's storytelling. Documentary film has been around for decades. And so I think that uh, multimedia is just a new platform, but it's not new. What's new is the internet. D documentary filmmaking is, is what we think is multimedia. So multimedia is a technology, it's an approach, it's, 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 it's just a new version of documentary filmmaking. So I think multimedia is great. I think every way we can continue to challenge the experience of how we engage in these stories and these issues is very, is very, very good for us. The reason why I cover the conflict in Kandahar is it ties to my family history, suffering in conflict in the Second World War. And uh, I really felt like in my lifetime, I, I have a window to say something about the world. And if I can remind people about the suffering of others, then that's my job. So I had a bad back because you have to wear the body armor all the time. So I had this bad back, was, all my back was sore all the time and I thought, so I asked the soldier, I said, hey, you know, do you have, uh, do you have some like, you know, ibuprofen, some, some painkillers? He says, yes, I saw a bottle somewhere in the tent. So he brings it over and there's no label. I said, do you know what this is? He goes, yeah, yeah, trust me, trust me. I open it in these pink pills and I, I took these pills. We went in some combat, I came back. My back was feeling good. I felt so relaxed. I thought, these are really strong. I have no muscle problems, whatever. And then after about two days of the combat, we came back to the base and he said, so how did those pills work out? I said, oh, they worked out very good. He goes, oh, those are female menstrual cycle pills. Extra strength. And this is, you know, it, it's like in the middle of all this hell, you have to play some jokes or you do not survive. So I have many stories like this. So I just thought I'd end with something funny. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay, no problem, man. That's it. Okay.